Welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Colin Brusanthus, a Canadian educator and activist and organizer with Community Wealth Candidates. In a few seconds, we'll be talking to Paul Jay about Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Why do you think Nancy Pelosi is making this trip to Taiwan? And how dangerous is it? How concerned should we be? Thanks, Colin. As you know, President Xi Jinping had warned Biden before Pelosi's trip that people who play with fire will get burnt. So it's not a surprise then that China followed up on her visit to Taiwan with a show of force. According to the Global Times, which generally speaks for the Chinese government in English, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, the PLA, on Thursday commenced the second phase of its large-scale military exercises that completely locked down the island of Taiwan, began to use live fire. Global Times continues that this followed U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island which Global Times says seriously violated China's sovereignty. The report continues the unprecedented drills featured long-range rocket artillery, anti-ship ballistic missiles, stealth fighter jets, an aircraft carrier group with a nuclear-powered submarine, as well as realistic tactics that simulated a real reunification by force operation, demonstrating and honing the PLA's capabilities to not only take over the island, but also prevent any external interference, including from the U.S., end quote. Okay, let me say that one line again. Essentially, it was a dress rehearsal for the taking over of Taiwan. Quote, realistic tactics that simulated a real reunification by force operation. I think China could have played down the significance of the visit, but it chose not to, given Pelosi the world stage for her crazy, reckless stunt. But the CCP gets a chance to show the Chinese people it will defend China's honor and national pride. It's not afraid to use military force. It's also an opportunity for making it clear to the government of Taiwan what's in store if they declare formal independence. I also think it's a completely unnecessary response to be threatening the people of Taiwan with such devastating might. Pelosi's visit didn't create an imminent threat to China. And in what world does this help persuade the people of Taiwan that they want to join with the rest of China? But how dangerous is the situation? Crazy things do happen, but at this point, it doesn't seem Pelosi's visit leads to war. But the visit is a reflection of the dangerous chaos that is U.S.-China policy. I also have a little bit of a hard time understanding exactly what kind of position the American government is taking towards China in general. Well, first of all, there's objective considerations and subjective considerations. So what I mean by that is the rivalry between the United States and China, two big countries, uh, one fully capitalist, the one to a large extent capitalist, um, uh, with China becoming an economy that will be uh, as big as and then bigger. So that's objective. That's uh, happening. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It's happening. Subjective is about what people think. Uh, prestige, ego, national identity, these are all things that go on in people's brains, uh, sometimes as a reflection of objectivity and sometimes as a reflection of propaganda and inculcation. So on the face of it, objectively, who gives a damn if Nancy Pelosi goes to China? I mean, does it, what does it change? I mean, she's about as important to the making of U.S. foreign policy, well, I guess more than I am, but not a lot more than I am, other than that she's going there. 
and nobody would care if I did. But the, the fundamental issues around Taiwan have to do with this economic rivalry, and then they have to do with two very important objective factors, arms sales and semiconductors. So does Nancy Pelosi in any way change the equation on arms sales? Well, maybe an iota, you know, create some more tension. Maybe it's an excuse to have more arms. But it could actually even cut the other way. If you look at the American reaction in the press and political, most of the political elite, not the rabid right, the neocons who love her for doing this. But most of the reaction is this is, you know, playing with fire. It's a tinderbox. You're uh, provoking China for no reason. It could almost cut against more arms sales to Taiwan as much as it could help it. So I don't know. I, I think in the reality, objectivity of her going is like practically irrelevant. I, I, she's an irrelevant figure, except she's being made out to be a more important figure. So why? Uh, one, because it serves, she thinks it serves, domestic U.S. politics to look tough on China. I guess she knows more about U.S. politics than I do. Not I guess. I'm sure she does. Uh, I never got elected to anything. Maybe she's right. Maybe being tough on China helps her in some places. I, I would guess the places it helps her, it doesn't help her enough. Republicans who despise her are not going to vote for her because she makes a trip to Taiwan. Uh, but at any rate, uh, let's assume she went there for electoral reasons. On the other side, for China, uh, why do they give a damn if Nancy Pelosi goes to China? Uh, how does it change anything? It doesn't. She's, she's, as I said, irrelevant to the making of U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, you know, uh, is, is China, is the United States going to sell more or less arms to China? Because to Taiwan, no. Are, is it going to change the semiconductor situation? And for people who don't know, Taiwan is the largest manufacturer of semiconductors in the world. And uh, it's by, by, a large, by a long stretch of it. Uh, so the United States does not want China to hold of ta control of Taiwanese semiconductors, which is part of why they've got to defend Taiwanese democracy. Uh, if democracy is made with semiconductors. Um, and of course, China, Taiwan's a significant uh, purchaser of American arms. Her visit doesn't change any of that. So why make such a big deal out of it if you're China? Well, for two reasons. One, the Biden administration has been inching closer to what is a Chinese red line, was a declaration of Taiwanese formal independence from China. Um, now, I don't know how real that is. They have been crossing some lines, like at the Biden's inauguration, he invited a representative of Taiwan, which I think the first time that ever happened. Uh, does it really change anything? Well, sort of in terms of perception, but they keep declaring, and Pelosi's delegation to Taiwan on Tuesday also declared that this visit doesn't change uh, the declaration that was made in, what was it, 1979 with Nixon. It doesn't declare, it changed the 1982 declarations and agreements. Or the, and, and there was another set of promises to Taiwan called the Six Assurances. All of those things, they recognize essentially that ta Taiwan's part of China, but it's ambiguous language. Uh, they do agree not to have state-level relations with Taiwan, um, but they, uh, they also agree to kind of at some point diminish U U.S. arms sales to Taiwan, but they've agreed to disagree on when they're going to phase out arms sales because that's what China agreed to. And China, under this was done during Teng Xiaoping, and 
their motive was to open China up to American capital and open up American markets, and which was part of the whole strategy of uh, uh, restoration of capitalism in China. And so China had to make a deal to open up China to global capitalism. They had to make a deal over Taiwan, so they kind of agreed to disagree on arms. And American capital wanted to China, and so they come up with this idea in American foreign policy called uh, uh, a policy of ambiguity over Taiwan, which means the United States will never affirm that if China makes a move to reincorporate Taiwan into China, uh, that the United States won't make it clear that they will defend Taiwan, a, a sort of Article 5 like in NATO. Uh, so the ambiguity is the United States will never absolutely declare that uh, because China would take that as a direct intervention in their sovereignty. And so the Biden administration has been inching closer to quote-unquote strategic clarity, uh, which is coming out and saying, which Biden actually said, uh, we will defend Taiwan. And then, of course, his staff jumped in and said, oh, we're not giving up the policy of ambiguity and blah, blah, blah. I think what's going on here is posturing. So I talked about objective factors, and now we're kind of into subjective factors, which is nobody wants to to lose prestige. Uh, Biden wants to look tough on China for American politics. He doesn't want to have this as a weak spot in fighting the Republicans. Um, it serves the military industrial complex to have almost war. And the more um, almost war you have, the better it is. Uh, and this was true under the Trump administration. Uh, you know, they've commissioned, they're commissioning, I think it's uh, 10 new Ford class aircraft carriers at a cost of something like 13 or 14 billion dollars each. You can't justify that without an almost war with a major power, major power, major nuclear power, because if you're in a war even against an Iraq, you don't need 10 aircraft carriers. Now, the joke of it is, or the irony or the stupidity is aircraft carriers are useless against China or Russia for that matter, because both countries have the technology to knock out aircraft carriers relatively quickly. They would only be good against smaller powers who don't have that capacity, in which case you don't need 10 of them. So it's bullshit. It's a boondoggle to spend money and make money for the military industrial complex. But the subjective factor that's about prestige, about positioning, about we can't look weak. It, it, it isn't a non-factor. It exists partly for propaganda, both on the Chinese and the American side, but also in a way that a lot of the military leaders and political have internalized it as a real thing. So there's a very interesting thing that happened in 1958. Formosa, 100 miles from the Red Chinese mainland, the U.S. bound by treaty to its defense. In the Formosa Strait, Chinese communist aggression centering around Kamoi poses the question of how far the U.S. will go trying to defend the offshore islands. In 1958, uh, China, led by Mao Zedong, uh, wanted to reincorporate Taiwan back into China. It had been seized by Chiang Kai-shek, who led this... Uh, nationalist army uh, that should be said were mostly collaborators with the Japanese and spent more time fighting against a communist-led People's Liberation Army than they did fighting against the Japanese. They fought against the Japanese somewhat. There, there was a, 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 a united front for a while. They, the Kuomintang, as they were called, did fight sometimes against the Japanese. The Chinese Communist Party was far more popular Millions and millions and millions of people supported it. And when the war was over, the PLA uh, took control of the Chinese government, and Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang ran to Taiwan. And the Americans jumped in to defend 
this anti-communist, fascist dictatorship. And that's what it was in 1958, a reactionary, essentially fascist dictatorship in Taiwan. And the United States defended it because they were... This was, not, okay? this was not promoting a democracy, just to be clear. <laughs> they, there was not even a pretension of it. There was no, like everybody acknowledged. But in 1958, all that mattered is you were anti-communist. Being a democracy was quite secondary. Summoned to emergency conference, Secretary of State Dulles to meet with President Eisenhower. Earlier, Mr. Dulles had conferred with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then talked with the President three times by phone. The Dulles-Eisenhower meeting is followed by a statement in which Red China is solemnly warned by the President that he will not hesitate to commit American armed forces to the defense of the nationalist offshore islands if he finds that necessary to the security of Formosa. Not alarming, but rather giving Beiping a chance to back off is the U.S. stand. Meanwhile, the U.S. 7th Fleet has been steaming to within striking range to prevent invasion of Formosa from the mainland and vice versa. It is stressed the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek can handle any present threat to their territory. Help would come only if the defense is proved inadequate. PLA says, look, we're, we're blowing these things up to show you we're serious. And uh, if you Americans try to interfere in, uh, you know, us retaking Taiwan, uh, we're showing you we're willing to use military force. So there's a meeting of the Joint Chiefs. And the documents of the uh, minutes of the meeting were part of a report that took place in 1964 that was commissioned by uh, McNamara uh, commissions a report of the 58 Taiwan crisis to break down what happened. And in that report are the minutes of the, the Joint Chiefs meeting. And Els, Daniel Ellsberg, who released the Pentagon Papers, part of what he took when he took the Pentagon Papers was this report. And so now he released sections of the report, and in an interview I did with him, he read me sections that were still classified, which is going to be part of the film I'm making, but anyway. So in the minutes of the joint conversation of the Joint Chiefs, one of the generals actually says that Eisenhower has already authorized us that if we can't defend Taiwan, we should use nuclear weapons. And one of the other generals says, really? He's actually already authorized it. Yes, it's, we're authorized that if it looks like we're, uh, we, the Taiwan, the Chiang Kai-shek's army and the American army are facing defeat, where we can use nuclear weapons against non-nuclear at that time China and take out a military installation and maybe even a city near the border, near where the artillery is. So another general says, well, hold on. W why are we going to do this? He says, oh, somebody says, but well, why is Taiwan so important to us? And he says, why do we care about Chiang Kai-shek anyway? And the first general says something like, I, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's pr I'm, I'm pretty close to quoting it. He says, because the prestige and influence and credibility of the U.S. umbrella in Asia will be compromised. For the prestige, so, they were w willing to throw a nuclear well, weapon. Well, let's, so that's what the next guy says. This next general says, but what will be the response of the Soviet Union? Hasn't Khrushchev said he will support China if attacked with nuclear weapons with nuclear weapons? Won't they, at the, you know, at, at the very least, won't they use a nuclear weapon against Taiwan? And, that'll be the, and then what are we actually defending? Because there'll be no Taiwan left. And the first guy says, the alternative is worse. What's the alternative? Losing prestige and credibility. Then the other guy says, well, if they nuke Taiwan, don't we have to respond? And one of the generals says, yeah. Well, doesn't that lead to nuclear war. Yeah. Because a lot of the Joint Chiefs at that time 
uh, believed that it, they should use any excuse possible for a uh, first strike against the Soviet Union. And this came out again during the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the majority of the Joint Chiefs wanted to have a strike against the Soviet Union, and Kennedy didn't go for it. And so, again, this guy says, well, the, the alternative's worse, the loss of credibility and prestige. So it was ridiculous. Like, the objectivity, Taiwan was meaningless. Nobody gave a damn about the actual, I mean, at that time, there's no arms sales or semiconductors. There's a bunch of rock and, and Chiang Kai-shek's ragtag army. Uh, but still, because the commitment had been made to defend it, you can't lose your prestige and credibility. Now, it didn't go nuclear because Mao Zedong, either they directly threatened China, which I think they did, or he learned, found out about it. I think they threatened. Mao Zedong decided that this wasn't worth risking because at that time China had no nuclear weapons and two, Mao Zedong Tung knew something the Americans didn't was that Khrushchev was not going to reply. And by that time things were starting to get frosty between China and the Soviet Union. So Mao Zedong knowing that they were in a, a, quite a vulnerable position uh, backed off and they stopped shelling these outgrowths of posts of rock. Anyway, jump ahead. You can, you can see how important it is to the Americans, to the Chinese now especially, when you sell such an important nar nationalist narrative to your population. And it's, imp it's so important to how you keep the fabric of your society together and supporting the governance of whoever's governing, you know, whether it's the American elites through their parties or the uh, credibility of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, and, and where you promote nationalism so much, uh, then this kind of subjective factor matters because you're afraid your narrative will unravel. So you got to look strong. You can't look weak. Now, it's a little different because the American narrative is far, far more, I shouldn't say more, entirely based on a more aggressive posture. And American prestige and credibility was and is based on maintaining American hegemony in the world and in the area. Uh, the Chinese nationalism is more based on a defensive posture. You have to rally the population to defend socialism, uh, whether, you, what, whether you, to what extent you consider socialist, China socialist, capitalist, hybrid, uh, whatever it is, it's not at least at, at this time, and I don't see in any foreseeable time, but maybe, who knows, you can't rule it out depending what happens in Chinese politics. It's not an aggressive military posture. You know, economically, they're reaching around the globe, uh, but they are not building uh, a military projection, uh, you know, maybe in a minor way. You know, they have, you know, they have subs, but that's a deterrent. Do they really need an aircraft carrier? Maybe not, but still, they're not, their global power is based on their financial and economic power. Uh, so the nationalism there has a somewhat different character, but still you've got to maintain it. And right now they're heading towards a, a Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's a good time to rally the troops because why, like, why, why not just ignore Pelosi going? You know, why not say, listen, when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, uh, Pelosi's a mosquito and you could insult her Treat her as irrelevant, which she kind of is when it comes to these issues, and not let it be an issue. What kind of position the American government is taking towards China? Is there a, a coherent position taking shape here, or are we just being hit with, you know, everything under the sun that people think will, will win votes and they're switching positions right, left, and center? The problem for the American elites is there is no coherent position possible except give up 
being the global hegemon. And to some extent, you almost have to give up on American-style capitalism. So here's the problem. China is going to be equal and then superior in terms of the size of the economy. It's happening no matter what you do, except you know maybe the Americans can create a pandemic that wipes out China. I mean, short of something crazy, <laughs> which I'm not expecting. Uh, China is going to, at the very least, be the equal and really the superior. There's an interesting quote from Putin. NBC asked Putin, if there was a, a, some kind of nuclear strike on Russia, even small scale, would you reply with a large counter strike on the United States, knowing it would end life on Earth? And his answer was, what would be the point of life on Earth without a Russia? And I think the Americans think exactly the same thing. Like a, a, a lot of the in, you know, really baked in ideology, and we shouldn't underestimate the subjective factor here, how much a lot of the military leadership, how much a lot of the political leadership in both parties are true believers in Cold War ideology. The essence of which was that the Soviet Union and then China are inherently aggressive and they want to take over the world. And we, American capitalism, is the only thing standing between authoritarianism and democracy. You can't underestimate how much these people actually believe it, even though it's more or less nonsense. I mean, nobody has supported fascist dictatorships around the world more than the United States. And the United States is the defender of Saudi Arabia. You know, and you can go on from there. Anyone watching this knows this history. So the idea of it's democracy versus authoritarianism, it's very hypocritical. But here's what I think these people believe. We Americans do bad things for good reasons. Everyone else does bad things for bad reasons. When we support a reactionary fascist dictatorship, we're only doing it to stop the communists who are worse. In which case, we support dictatorship to defend democracy. They believe this crap. Now, it's very... And we saw it... We saw in Chile yeah. with uh, Henry yeah. Kissinger, even if democracy was what elected the socialists, you overthrow yeah. the socialists in order to... In a, an example, yeah. <laughs> hundreds of examples, probably. Um, but you can't underestimate how much these people really believe it. They don't, it's not just a propaganda point. They have internalized the logic because it serves them to do so. You know, it's people like to believe things that make them rich. Like, why do the super wealthy, this is, I'll go back to something I said in another interview with you. Why do the super wealthy believe they deserve to be super wealthy? I mean, they can look around them. They see the poverty, they see the chaos, they see the climate crisis, threat of nuclear war. You know, how do they believe it's okay to keep this, such a system going? Well, one because of they believe it's a meritocracy, we deserve it. We worked our way to the top, and that's the way life works. It's social Darwinism, you know, the, the strong should succeed, which is nonsense. Two, I mean, someday we can do a thing on social Darwinism, but anyway. Two, because God made it so, which is why so, many, so much of the elites believe in God. You know, why did the feudal aristocracy so believe in the church and the, even you know the catholics the authority the pope and all the rest because it justified them being the aristocracy and they had to really they really had to believe in it you know when you're born you don't know what you're born into a society not of your choosing you're educated so in the united states or other countries but in the united states you're sent to schools 
that teach you to think like a class that rules. So whether it's a private school in New York or Harvard, you know, you are trained to think as the ruling class. Now, of course, some individuals break from it, but most don't. So part of that narrative of why I deserve to rule is American exceptionalism. America's right to be the global hegemon. And, it, you know, before, you know, World War II, you know, it was okay to be an, an imperialist. It was a good thing. You know, it, you know, before World War I, too, even, you know, wars of aggression, plundering people, genocide of native people, rah, rah, it was a good thing. You know, if you were a leader that accomplished those things, you were a success story. It wasn't until after the Nuremberg trials this was condemned. Well, a lot of that mentality still exists in the ruling classes. 